was an indigenous opinion. I was like, I suppose those advanced degrees from Harvard now actually don't mean much to you. No. So it is that whole marginalization of indigenous knowledge that it continues to exist in most regulatory agencies. Uh, three year battle at the Minnesota legislature resulted in a law in Minnesota which requires a full environmental impact assessment and cultural impact assessment before the <coughs> any genetically engineered test of patties and wild rice in the state of Minnesota. We didn't get a full moratorium, which is what we wanted. We don't have that. Our tribes all have moratoriums in terms of our tribal jurisdiction. Um, but so far we have done well, and I think the bar is pretty high in Minnesota, and I'm hopeful that we will maintain the genetic integrity of our workers. So that is my experience of this topic. You know, as a result of that, I've been called into other communities, you know, and, and I am fully aware, as are you, of the sacredness of our food. Our word mandamin is a word for corn, which means wondrous seed. Sacred food. Just as the people don't hear Very sacred food. You know, it is a little different to us. It's not part of our cosmic genealogy. We do not descend from heaven wrapped in a corn husk as the Pawnees did. But I understand what they're talking about. Two years ago, or no, several years ago, it was on races. Don't you know the guys out there? Actually, if you look at this, when it goes through again, you'll notice it's like a, I don't know how we got it, one of those bags is a uh, U.S. aid bag for lentils. It's like, where did we get the U.S. aid bag? <laughs> and, we, and I was like, very, we're very clever about that. This is our corn. Uh, we, are the, we are, people from here are southern growers of corn from the south. We are the northern most corn growers of corn. This is me trying to be a beekeeper. It was an awkward moment. This is obviously a problem. Um, but we pushed corn 100 miles north of Winnipeg, Canada. We have varieties known as uh, Bear Island Flint, Mountain White Flint, Saskatchewan Flint, that are frost resistant, drought resistant, and wind resistant. They are not unlike the corn varieties that are grown in this area, that most of our varieties grow this tall. And when, over the past couple of years, they had wind storms that blew through and ravaged corn fields. Monsanto's fields fell over, but ours still stood. So that is why you need to protect agrobiodiversity. If you want to eat, you got to have something that's going to hang out at a time of climate change. That is why the work you are doing is so important. If we lose our seeds, if we, if, if, if the world's foods are all owned by Monsanto, we will not do well. At the same time, you know, we just hosted our great indigenous farming conference. It's called the Great uh, Lakes Indigenous Farming Conference, 10th year. So I could be annual party I throw every year. 100, 150 farmers, indigenous <coughs> people, allies come from our region. This is a Pawnee Eagle War. And in that, um, we talked about our strategies. And our strategies are not different from any other people. You oppose Monsanto at every turn. Do you watch this Supreme Court case that is now? Or Monsanto's case is at the Supreme Court? Do you challenge them with tribal jurisdiction? Because our tribes also have jurisdiction which is not exercised on food from seed to table, frankly. Right. It is, you know, and what I am sure is that, as in the words of my friend Paul Smith, from Oneida, you can't say you're sovereign if you can't feed yourselves. And we, as indigenous people, said we have the argument. 
So the centerpiece of our ability to sustain ourselves is in fact quite tied to our ability to keep our agrobiodiversity. We talked about that at the Farming Conference, and then we talked about that essentially, from our perspective, a centerpiece of resistance is to grow up, to keep our seeds, to reaffirm our relationship to our food, to our seeds, to our relatives through ceremony, and through how we live. Because we can talk. But in the end, if you are if you are not in relationship to your relatives, you're just talking. So that is a little bit about what we do. The story I told you is a story that can be told on many other communities. A few years ago I went to testify at the Hawaiian legislature because the University of Hawaii, being as uh, what is the relationship we would call it? Engaged with corporate agriculture as the University of Minnesota and most other universities at this point in time. Um, wanted to genetically engineer Kalo, which is terrible. Kalo, um, in Hawaiian terminology, you know, from what I understand, having you know been with them and listening to their legislative testimony, they used a term called cosmogenealogy. Which means that when the first spirit beings were birthing life forms, the first that was born was Kalo, it was a stillborn child. And they buried that child and it became terror. The most essential food of much of the Pacific Islands. The second child born was Kami or the Hawaiian person. And so in their understanding of who they are in the world, their older brother is Kalo, is Tara. And so the question of who has the right to genetically engineer your relative is the same question that is asked. So for those of you who are here, you know, I heard your introductions and I was really interested in what many of you are doing. I'd like to encourage you in your work. I'd like to say that, you know, I am fully aware of the fact that what we do in my community has implications for United Nations work. It has implications for other indigenous communities. <coughs> uh, we do the best we can to hold fast in our work. And the issues that are discussed here are <clears throat> essential, you know, to all of us. I'm an economist by trade, not a lawyer. I used to say, I used to want to be a lawyer, but I'd say I spent all my time getting my cousins out of jail for stupid stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I still spend an enormous amount of time getting my staff and my cousins out of jail for stupid stuff. <laughs> But in that, you know, I have the privilege, you know, of living in my own community, working in my own community, having a large extended family. We're good, you know, being a member of our traditional societies. And then I have the privilege that I wander around the world to see what is going on in places, although my Spanish is not good. <laughs> Which is a, sh a bit of shame, actually, every time I come down here, I'm like, oh, my Ojibwe is better than my speech. But having said that, as we talk about the strategies in our own communities, it is really important in institutions like this to push the paradigm. Because the reality is, is that just because they lie, and repeat the lie over and over does not mean it is true. So you cannot continue teaching 
a paradigm based on conquest. You can't continue teaching a paradigm that is based on the idea of a growth economy. Because we have consumed too much of the biosphere already. And our Mother Earth cannot sustain our people. You cannot continue to teach a set of legal doctrine that is created from a dysfunctional set of Christian doctrine and pretend that it is justice. You know, these institutions must be challenged with reality. They must be challenged with social movements And we must exercise righteous behavior and illustrate what is righteous. So as an economist, I look at the ideas that are reflected now, and instead of being based on quarterly profits and GNP, I am attracted to the idea of intergenerational equity. The idea that you cannot justify the carbon that is in the air now for BHP Billiton's profits, Four Corners Power Plant's profits, NGS, APS. You cannot justify their quarterly profits at the expense of the planet's combustion. Can only burn 565 gigatons of carbon without causing absolute climate chaos. 565 gigatons of carbon. The reserves of coal companies, oil companies, 2,795 gigatons on paper. They call that an asset. I call that a liability. Just because you claim to own coal reserves that are in the ground does not mean you should never take them out. And those of you who are indigenous students here, you know a third of all coal in the United States, a third of all Western coal is in indigenous territories. Navajo Nation in Crow, Crow has 17.1 billion tons. Should not ever come. Right. Tribal sovereignty is not a carte blanche. For destroying the environment. The issues that you discuss here are issues of economics and law. Not all things can be commodified. Not all things are oppressed. You cannot commodify life. You cannot commodify spirit. Can put a price tag on water, water rights, but it is really unreal, frankly. We are not making any new water. What we have is what we're going to have. It's the same water as when dinosaurs were here. And if you buy the right to poison it, you have not bought anything with any justice. Not all things can be commodified. And the intangibles that exist, that are our spiritual relationship, exemplified by our spiritual relationship to places like the San Francisco <laughs> Peaks. You know, the four sacred mountains here, our own most sacred places. You know, those are not, and they cannot be. In the, in the bargaining. The ideas that we talk about in our traditional life forms, in, in our traditional knowledge systems of our responsibility to all relatives, translated into economic terms in terms of interspecies equity. That is, we don't have a right to destroy our relatives. I, you know probably many of these things, but what I'm fully aware of, lecturing at many colleges, is that economics departments don't teach ecological economics. Don't teach indigenous economics. They teach Keynesian economics 
systems based on a predator economy without the ability to continue. And those institutions in that paradigm is replicated and the mythology is perpetuated. And the law justifies it. So instead of the rights of corporations, as entrenched under the US law, what we need is something more like many South American countries have now embraced, but the rights of Mother Earth and the rights of nature. Instead of forcing our First Nations, our indigenous peoples, into a, a dysfunctional economic system, which causes us to prostitute ourselves, our spiritual relationship to our Mother Earth through fracking our homelands, through putting a price tag on things that have no price. Because there is this idea that we'll get full time employment, or that we are underachieving adults because we are unemployed. The recognition that our traditional life ways have more value and more durability than a fossil fuels economy is essential. So in Ecuador, for instance, the Yasumi Trust, is that how you say it? Some of these projects and this work that is underway to stop third world countries from having to mortgage their future by servicing World Bank debt, the interest of World Bank debt at that, by destroying the wealth of their territory and their rainforest, is a model that we should all challenge. No one has a right to destroy our money, because where are we going to be? Where are we going to be? So the rights of nature, reflected perhaps until it is, uh, what, what are they, until it is withdrawn in something like today fundamental law. These are good teachings to keep. You know? We are the people who are here. You know, I'm in this room and we're the ones here. But we are also the ones that are here in this time and place. I think of this as a land of giants and legends. And my sister of mine said, we need some modern day monster slayers. That's what she said. I understood exactly what she meant. These are forces of evil that surround us and our mother. And surround all our relatives, whether they have wings or fins, or hooves or roots. The people that must have the courage to protect them are you. You can look around for some reinforcements, and there are. There are a lot of people working in grassroots communities who are fighting these things. We need to always encourage and reaffirm each other. Draw sustenance and joy from seeing each other's faces. And then always look to our allies who, who may not be home maybe in these institutions and encourage them to do the right thing. You got a shot at keeping the top of a mountain from getting blown off? Keep everything from getting genetically engineered in the world? Keeping them from combusting the planet to oblivion? Keeping some water and a few aquifers and some rivers in the southwest? What a great sacred opportunity that is. I want to thank you for your time and for having me and wish you the best for your comments. Congratulations. Oh.